As a structural engineer, I use mathematics day in day out to complete a lot of my tasks, from the most simplest to the most complex. This is despite the rise of computing, helping offload a lot of those complex and repetitive tasks. Yes, computers have made structural engineering much easier and much more accessible. That it does not mean that you do not need to have a solid founding in both pure mathematics and structural mechanics. As how can you quickly assess what the model has actually produced is accurate or not? Or if you're in a meeting and there's a proposed change to your design, how can you have a talk through the architects and other consultants in the room, the impact of that change? So I'll be going through some of the mathematics and structural mechanics that I use on a regular basis to help both me assess a model and the impacts potential changes could have on a design. My name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. So I'll start off with just some of the pure mathematics that I use on a regular basis. And this is mainly around geometry and trigonometry. So starting off with Pythagoras, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. This is when I'm trying to find a hypotenuse of a right angle triangle. So I try and use this around say strut and tie. So this allows me to work out what the tension forces are going to be in the structure, what the tie actions are going to be. Or if I'm trying to spread the load inside a structure, just say I've got a column over and a wall under, spreading that load. So I know what load spread the load's going to be when it's applied to the wall underneath. So I have some understanding of where the loads are going and how much spread is going to be seen inside the design. And even things like soccer toa, sine is opposite over our hypotenuse, cos is adjacent over our hypotenuse, or toa is opposite over adjacent. So knowing when to use sine, cos, or tan. These functions also come in handy is when you've got a vectored load going through a structure and you don't necessarily have reinforcement following that vectored force. So you need to convert the different angles of all the different reinforcement to get a resultant or how much reinforcement you may need to put into the slab to be able to resist it. So when I'm doing either strut and tie or force flows through a structure, quite often I'll have to go through some sort of geometry mathematics to know where those forces are going and how are they going through my design. Another one that's used quite often is integration and differentiation. So it's not actually deriving the formulas or converting it back to a more simpler form as you would typically in integration and differentiation, but understanding what the relationships between each of them are, such as the area under the curve or the gradient of the line if we're differentiating. Because this gives a lot of information when we're trying to analyze the structure as how are these related to each other so for example when i'm doing bending moments and shear force diagrams we know that if we integrate the shear force diagram we get the bending moment diagram or likewise if we differentiate the bending moment diagram we get the shear force diagram so what is the relationship between two of them as we can see here the area under the curve of the shear force diagram should equate to the value that you see on the bending moment diagram so this gives us a number of key ideas of where we should see our peak forces. As wherever the shear force diagram crosses zero is where we should see our peak moments in our structure. Or likewise, when the force is, it has the greatest gradient on our bending moment diagram is when we will have the highest shear forces. And this is also helpful when we're looking at shear throws as well and why forces go on certain elements. Such as shear throw and a continuous member why that load increases on that first internal column because of these balancing of forces all the force will be dragged to that first internal column or the amplification that occurs to the column off a cantilever through just some basic geometry we can derive those forces for that first column and work out why that load is actually increased so i use a combination of these to help me improve the scheming of my buildings to see where the forces are going and also to ensure that the structure is behaving correctly and as expected I hope you haven't bored you yet with all the talk about mathematics. If you are enjoying it, hit that like button. It really helps me out. It gives me confidence on type of content to create for you. Now let's keep going. Done as well is reworking formulas. So you're trying to solve for a different answer. Because a lot of the time you may have unknowns inside your structure so you don't know how deep a structure is going to be or how thick a structure needs to be. Such as if your structure is governed by strength, you know what the strength of the material is you know what that bending moment is. However, you do not know what Z you need to be able to resist it. Or you may know the width, you may know the depth. So there may be an unknown in there. So you're able to rework the formula to solve for either that depth or thickness to give you the answer that you need through the knowns that you have in your side of your design. Another area, especially in connection design, similar, you may know roughly where your bolts need to be. So by reworking the formula and solving for T, you're able to use the knowns that you have at your fingertips. Be able to size for the most efficient plate. 
Now, a lot of the time you do not get that as accurate as you need to be. It might be 11.2, so therefore we need a 12 mil plate. However, it gives you a ballpark of where the answer should be instead of just guessing at the start. But having a solid founding of these mathematics is not really beneficial without having also a solid founding of structural mechanics. A lot of the time, especially from university, I use that first year static course on a regular basis. So deriving those bending moment diagrams, deriving those shear force diagrams, working out when my peak shear is gonna be, working out where my peak moments are gonna be, as where am I gonna put holes through a structure? I do not wanna put them at the peak moment. I do not wanna put them at the peak shear, but somewhere in between, which is roughly normally the third point. And by having an understanding of how the forces are gonna flow through the design, how to draw those bending moments and shear force diagrams, you can put penetrations here, we're not there and allow them to put holes through the structure where needed. So when you're at university, yes, that statics course may seem boring. However, this is something that you use on the most regular basis, more so than anything you do throughout your whole career. So when you're starting out is having a solid founding in the structural mechanics of statics. Yes, there is formulas you can get out there that help you derive some of those answers. However, you need to be able to quickly look at the answers that you're getting to know whether you will actually loaded the structure up accurately or not. So having that understanding of the relationship between bending moments and shear force diagrams. So as you can see, when we start off with loads, we move into shear forces. So we're integrating each time. We then move into bending moments. Then we add a stiffness factor to that, which is normally EA. And we go across to our deflections. You go down to rotation and you go all, all the way through to curvature. So by having an understanding of the relationship of how the structure behaves, just by either having the shear force diagram, bending moment diagram, or deflections, you should be able to roughly work out where your peak forces are going to be. So when you're analyzing a structure, where are the correct critical design zones they need to look out for? And as we use a lot of materials on a regular basis, it's also having an understanding of how those materials behave. So the structural mechanics behind those materials, not just how to design for them, Say, for example, concrete has a number of different aspects that you need to assess as it's a time dependent structure. So it changes over the time that it's loaded or even redistribution of forces, how does that occur? So for example, the redistribution of forces are from the structure becoming weaker and it redistributing to the more stiffer elements. So if you need a high level of redistribution in your design, it means there'll be a high level of cracking inside your structure. And also likewise, when you're doing composite actions or even steel or transmission of forces through different elements, what is the strain compatibility between two of them? As this will help you not only derive how a doubly reinforced section works, but also the way the forces are gonna flow through your design. As force generally flows through a structure on the stiffest path, whether that be the most flexural stiffest location or under compression, the most area based on its E value. So for example, steel has a much higher E than concrete. So therefore it needs a much lesser area to better attract a similar load. Another key aspect, especially on taller buildings, not only over time do they shrink from shrinkage. So as concrete ages, it shrinks through the loss of water, but it also has an elastic shortening as well through the load that is applied to it. So this allows you to have an understanding of how you need to balance forces between different elements. So if you've got a concrete column and a steel column in the same structure, you want to make sure that one is not overloaded against the other. So have an understanding of how they perform over time. So you may need to have an upper and lower bound. For example, steel does not really shrink over time, though it does elastically shorten and sim similar to concrete. It has generally a steel section is a lot smaller than a concrete section. You generally see a lot more elastic shortening from that steel design. So you may need to either oversize that steel design for the short term to allow they don't overload the concrete column or likewise the concrete column may need to be a little bigger to ensure it's not overstressed against a wall. So having an understanding of how they're behaving will allow you to work out how to size a structure because it's not necessarily just about sizing it for strength. You may even need to size it just for its long term characteristic behavior or even how it performs under load. As the stiffest path always wins, if another part element is stiffer because it's either bigger or oversized, means despite you wanting to load at 50-50, it might load 70-80, which may actually overload that stiffer element. We're talking about how a structure behaves, both through that pure mathematical form and the flow of forces through a design. This is a way that you can quickly assess if the model is behaving. If you know the structural mechanics behind it, all we're talking about is the way the model is performing and the way the flow of forces is through your design. If it's gonna be a greatly different way to what you're actually expecting, you need to really drill down on that model to see there is no modeling errors. As there's either two causes of this, 
either there's a major design assumption or missing data that you need to put into your thought process or the model is wrong and you need to work out which one it is. And these are just some quick ways to help you out with that. Now let's keep moving with structural mechanics. Another element that I use all the time, especially in concrete mechanics, is trying to design the stresses through the element. And this is through a formula known as Big K that I may have talked about earlier, which is M on BD squared. Essentially, this is an assessment of how much tension is on the tension face of a flexural member. It is derived from Z, and by limiting to a factor such as 5, it means that you can have a lightly reinforced structure that still achieves an adequate design. Now, there are other critical elements as well when you're looking at stuff like this, is for a sample beam, because generally the way you're reinforcing it, 5 may be a good answer. But generally, slabs are more critical, they're normally designed for deflection, so therefore they normally have a lower K factor. So normally have a K factor of 3, so they're generally a little bit less efficient than a beam to achieve the same deflection ratio. Also with concrete is having an understanding of how it performs under either compression load or tension action. So we all know concrete universally is good under compression. It performs quite well. It's quite a robust material under those compressive forces. However, having an understanding that when it has a tension force, at what point does it yield tensile capacity of the concrete? But it's also a brittle failure, so it'll snap quickly, and distributing the load to it. Hopefully those steel reinforcement bars you have inside your design. So this gives you a number of different, but also knowing how the flow of force goes through your design. So which side is going to be in compression on a flexural member, and which side is going to be in tension on that same member. Because when you're putting such things as structural fixings to your slab or structure over or under, are you in a tension phase or in a compression phase? as a post-fixing connection in a tension phase has a lot less capacity than if it's in a permanent compression force. So this allows you to more efficiently design elements on their correct locations. So if you've got a member that has to be fixed that tension phase, then obviously you need more fixing at that point. However, if you can move it across a little bit further, you may be able to find those compression blocks and have a lot higher capacity, therefore need less fixings. So this allows you to give the design a more efficient approach if you have the flexibility and knowing where those locations are going to be. Now that's only concrete. And we've got other elements such as steel. Now steel is a lot easier than concrete generally as it doesn't really change over time unless it's gone past its elastic zone. But really where should you be focusing your design and what type of mathematics do I use to help scheme up building in steel? Well you've got to know where the critical elements are. Yes, framing up your members is quite efficient and reworking those formulas again, because a lot of time a steel structure is longer spanning. So it's typically governed by deflection. So reworking the formulas to solve for an I allows you to quickly work out what is the most efficient member size that I need to control my deflections in these locations. Also, connections are normally typical, most critical locations as well. You can again rework those formulas as most connections are quite simple. They are only really designed in the place for a th certain thickness. So you've got bolt locations in certain, in certain areas or constraints. Working out what moment is inside that structure, so you have to rework and solve for a thickness. Or alternatively, if that doesn't work, spacing the, spacing the bolts out a little bit further may allow you to either decrease that bending moment. Areas to be careful of with this is prying actions. So prying actions, what they do is the plate essentially will squish down to the bottom, prying up those bolts. So essentially moving up where the direct action of force is. So this allows for an amplification on the tension phase. So just having a quick understanding of how that's performing and looking into your codes to know what that amplification value should be. So by having a quick understanding of where your critical locations are, you're able to quickly break down those connection locations. And again, having an understanding of those bending moment and shear force diagrams is critical as well. Because when you're splicing members together, you do not want to hit those peak locations where the peak forces are. So having an understanding of where the minimum moments are going to be, so you can put that splice connection in the most appropriate location. Timber is another material as well that is semi-changing over time. Now, timber is not as time dependent as such elements such as concrete. However, it does have its unique characteristics. So how does a timber member behave? Which way are the grain's going? So when you're trying to design a bolt, what's the difference between having a cross grain versus a long grain force on the design? When you're compressing a member, obviously if you're compressing parallel to the grain, it's really good, where it's, if it's perpendicular to grain, you'll essentially squish it even more. So you'll have more compressing settlement inside your design, such as you've got a stud top and bottom under a highly loaded element. The stud will crush down more depending on which way you've actually put that stud into the structure. Another one is knowing the different species of timber that you have 
in your local area and what they're potentially going to use. As different species are more beneficial in different locations. So you may have different hardwoods and different other species that are more durable for the external use, maybe they're more expensive, or you could use other timbers that have been treated specifically for external use. And what elements do you use inside? Timber is actually quite a robust material. It has a wide range of strengths that can even exceed some concretes. So it's highly beneficial to have an understanding of how that timber is going to behave under a structural load to know where your critical design is. Now timber is somewhere between a steel and a concrete as it does have some of those aging characteristics. However, having some sort of understanding of what size timber you should have in there. Again, reworking those formulas is another area that you do all day in, day out. What goes at the start, what goes at the end, trying to solve for I's, trying to solve for Z's. So as you can see, as a structural engineer, we use mathematics on a regular basis. Is there any other mathematics that you use on a regular basis that helps your workflow? Please comment below. If you've made it to this point, if you haven't already, smash that like button. If you haven't subscribed, to get more updates about structural engineering, hit the subscribe button and to get all updates, you need to ding the bell. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.